So is this the first pub ranging of the year? You had one Friday night? So is this the second pub ranging of the year? Okay. For those who are watching online, we're uh, at Beis Rivka Seminary in Crown Heights, where I'm very proud to count myself as one of the members of the faculty. And uh, usually I'm here during the daytime, but it's a special event. We're here uh, in the evening to mark Chai Elul. OK, so Chai Elul, the 18th day of the Hebrew month of Elul, is the birthday or birthdays of both the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe. They both have the same birthday. The Baal Shem Tov, who was the first Rebbe of the Hasidic movement, was born Chai Elul in the year Nachas. That's uh, 1698. And uh, the Alter Rebbe was born the same date, Chai Elul, in the year Kohos, which is 1745. So 47 years apart. And uh, the connection between the, the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe not only is that they share a, a birth date, but that they came to the world for related missions. Their missions are related to each other because the Baal Shem Tov was the one who revealed the general teachings of Chassidus, and the Alter Rebbe made it more specific or more focused. He revealed the teachings of Chabad Chassidus. So uh, maybe let's talk a little bit about that. What's the difference between Chassidus in general, as revealed by the Baal Shem Tov, and Chabad Chassidus, as revealed by the Alter Rebbe? So uh, one of my kids, he's grown up now, but when he was uh, a little kid, like, four years old, he came home from nursery school with a card that he made for me. It was a little tracing of his hand. And then you know what he made it into? You know what they do with the little kids? What? He traced his hand, and then he made, made it into a turkey. You ever seen that, when the little kids make a little turkey? They trace their hand, and they make a beak right here. And this is the feathers. There's a little turkey, yeah. And, and it said, happy birthday, Tati. I love you. How do you think I felt? Just my heart melted. It wasn't my birthday, by the way, but he was four years old. He didn't know that. I'm not sure why there was a turkey either, because it was nowhere near Thanksgiving. But I don't care. I, my heart melted, because my little boy, Chick, he made me this beautiful card. So uh, I was thinking this gesture was so moving. I was thinking when my father has his next birthday, you know what I should do for him? I'll trace my hand, and I'll write, happy birthday. I love you. Why is that a beautiful birthday card from a four-year-old? but not a beautiful birthday card from an adult. I mean, what's wrong with it? It was, it was good when he was four. In fact, I, I might even argue that there's a certain purity, there's a certain sweetness that the four-year-old's birthday card captures that nothing an adult could do could capture. So The, the, the answer is that they're both beautiful. Well, both, what's both? I guess what we should determine, what would be an appropriate birthday card from, a, from an adult? What would be a beautiful birthday card from an adult? What? 
it should be longer. Like a letter. Maybe you'll say some things that are specific, like not just I love you, Tati, but hmm? poetry. Oh, that takes talent. Not everyone's a poet, but if you could pull it off, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, something that takes creativity, ingenuity, a little intelligence. Squat? Something he's always wanted. Oh, you're like a gift, not just a card, but yeah, send a gift as well. A thoughtful gift, something he's always wanted. So not just something that you. Some, what? Ahlata. Oh, so personal improvement. You're showing him in his honor, you're going to do something. Yeah, that, yeah, these are good things. What? <laughs> The Baal Shem Tov said about the Jewish people that every single Jew is beloved by Hashem like an only child born in his parents' old age. So Baal Shem Tov really likened the Jewish people to a beloved little child. By the way, the Baal Shem Tov himself was an only child born to his parents in their old age. You know the story of how the Baal Shem Tov's parents, even though they were, some say, as old as Avram, Avinu, and Sora Imeno, how they were zeichet to have a, a child at that advanced age. The Baal Shem Tov's father, Reb Eliezer, used to be into Achnos Zorchem. He used to bring in guests. He had a very big Shabbos table. And one Friday night, a guest came in late, and it was clear that he'd been traveling in a way that would be, a, would be in a violation of Shabbos. And the other guests were all religious Jews, so they were put off by the fact that this guy, in flagrant violation of Shabbos, was uh, crashing the party, so to speak. And they were not so uh, nice to him. They, they did not disguise their contempt. And actually, the Baal Shem Tov's father was personally hurt by this. It says that he went into the other room to cry because it was so painful to him that he saw that his other guests were being impolite to this, to this guest who was, not, who was not Shabbos observant. And at any rate, he came back out and he made sure that this guest should feel comfortable. And later on... Um, who does this guest turn out to be? I'm sure you know the story. The guest was none other than Elio Novi, the, private, uh, the prophet Elijah, who uh, came to visit the Baal Shem Tov's parents. And he told him that in the merit of your hospitality and your, your love of every Jew, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a, a child who will light up the world. So... <laughs> The Baal Shem Tov was born as a blessing, as a reward to his parents because they felt that kind of love, unconditional love, for every single Jew. And then the Baal Shem Tov came to the world, and that was also his mission, is to, to teach the unconditional love of every single Jew. And the way that he phrased it was, like I said, every Jew is beloved by Hashem like an only child born to his parents in their old age. Which, as I mentioned also, that would have been a description that Baal Shem Tov himself related to on a personal level because that, that was indeed his situation. So on a personal level, that, that was surely a meaningful concept. That's how he described every single Jew. So really, the Baal Shem Tov's whole mission was that at a time of crisis, it was a real spiritual crisis in the Jewish world at that time, the Baal Shem Tov healed the Jewish world with, with one message, the message that every Jew is beloved, every Jew is precious, like a, like a child, like a parent loves a child. 
the way that a parent looks at a child, just a little child, a beloved, precious little baby, and doesn't judge and doesn't condemn, just, just cherishes. That's how Hashem looks at a Jew. That, that was the Baal Shem Tov's message. And it, it's interesting that that was the Baal Shem Tov's message. The Baal Shem Tov came to the world at a time of real potential peril. The Jewish world was in a... An, an, many levels was in a state of crisis. There were terrible pogroms, massacres, a large segment of, of Eastern European Jewry had been brutally wiped out. There was poverty, real poverty. Um, there was uh, disillusionment because of a unfortunate uh, event that occurred in the, in the, just in the previous generation from the Baal Shem Tov where there was a belief in a false messiah who then became an apostate and left Judaism and led many people astray. There, there was a caste system, an unofficial caste system set up in Judaism where there were the sort of uh, the elite and then the disenfranchised. And on many different levels, economic and, and, and social, um, religious, there, there was a sense of, of despondency. People were, were losing hope. And it could have been, God forbid, it could have been a very uh, pivotal moment in a, in a negative sense, meaning we, we, we don't know how bad it could have been. But uh, because Baruch Hashem, the Baal Shem Tov came along and he sort of snatched the Jewish people back from the from the precipice, from the cliff, and averted the crisis. But how did he avert the crisis? What was the message that Baal Shem Tov came and, and revived the Jewish people with? It's very interesting, because he could have had a lot of messages. But the basic message, the underlying message of the Baal Shem Tov was to allow the individual to know how beloved he or she is to Hashem. That was the message that was needed more than anything else. To assure people that they are beloved, they're cherished. Like, a, like an only child born to his parents in their old age. In other words, the, the Baal Shem Tov, he reminded Jews of who they really are. And he said this, unequivocally about every single Jew, from the scholar to the layman, the rich, the poor, it didn't matter. A yid is a yid is a yid is a yid. That, that, that's Tehidus HaBal Shem Tov. That, that was the whole message. And it saved the Jewish world. And it's questionable if any other message could have saved the Jewish world. I mean... The fact is, that is the message that did save the Jewish world. Could another message have saved the Jewish world? I don't know. People needed to be reminded that they're beloved and cherished and precious. Like a child. Like the way that a parent loves a child. That's what they needed to hear at that moment. So, that's that's the Baal Shem Tov. What did the Alter Rebbe add to that? Or how did the Alter Rebbe continue that to the next level or the next step? We're precious because we have a neshama? Okay, but that was also understood in the Baal Shem Tov's message, that the preciousness means the Nisham. Hmm? Okay, so there's, you're referring to the famous parable that the al Rebbe gave actually in the time of his Rebbe, the Magid, we should just explain. The Baal Shem Tov had 60, 
six zero Shishim Talmidim. And now when I say at sixty Talmidim, obviously the Balshamtiv influenced tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews. But Talmidim I mean proper disciples, people who studied directly under him. And one of his disciples was the Mizritcha Magid, Reb Doiv Ber, and he became the, <clears throat> the successor of the Baal Shem. The Magid had 120, Pishnaim, double, double the number. The Baal Shem had 60 students, the Magid had 120 students. And <clears throat> among the Magid students were really the all stars. Basically, every Hasidic dynasty traces itself back to one of the Talmidei HaMagid, one of these disciples, one of these 120. The, uh, <laughs> the Alter Rebbe actually was, in a way, the odd man out, because the Baal Shem Tov, as well as uh, most of his Talmidim, were Polish Jews, Palish. And uh, the Alter Rebbe was uh, a Litvak, and they used to call him the Litvak. But they didn't let anyone else call him the Litvak. That was a, that was a known thing, that the other Talmidi Amagid, they called him their Litvak, but they didn't let anyone else refer to him that way. But these were the all-stars, Levi Yitzchak and the and uh, Reb Shmelkim in Nicholsburg, and his brother, Reb Pinchas the Balaflo, and the other, the other two brothers, Reb Zusha and Reb Eli Melech. It's funny, in the Welt, meaning the Chassidish Welt, they always say Reb Eli Melech and his brother, Reb Zusha. In Chabad, we always say Reb Zusha and his brother, Reb Eli Melech. You know why? I think, because Reb Zusha wrote a, a Haskama for Tanya. So we always like him. We give him <laughs> top billing. Yeah. You know why Reb Zusha wrote a Haskama for Tanya, by the way? Because uh, when the Alter Rebbe wrote the, the, the manuscript of Tanya, he had it sent to the Magad's oil. And uh, Reb Zusha lived there <laughs> in the same town as the Magad's oil, so he was... Uh, he was the closest one of the Talmidei Amagid, just on a practical level. So, uh, and I don't want to leave out any of the other Talmidei Amagid, because there were many other greats, and once I start, you know, leaving out names, and obviously, <laughs> I'm not going to name 120 students, but suffice it to say, they were all giants. They were all tzaddikim. And uh, the Alter Rebbe had his own style. They say that um, the Alter Rebbe was the only one from the Talmud Magid to hear an entire complete teaching of Chassidus from the Magid from beginning till end. Why is that? The other Talmudim were leaving, they would walk out in the middle, chas v'sholem. They were so holy that when the Magid would say chsidis, they would go into a state of dveikus, like an ecstatic trance. And one by one, they would just sort of leave themselves. Um, so then, the question arises, why didn't that happen to the Alter Rebbe? Why, well, he, wasn't so, he wasn't so sensitive? He wasn't so spiritual? And the answer is that the Alter Rebbe's whole approach, as he wrote in Tanya's, the brain has to rule over the heart. So even though he would get inspired, he would, no, 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 don't get carried away. <laughs> keep it reined in. Meichen, meichen, got to keep it. Keep it focused. So the, the Alter Rebbe's style of chassidus, Chabad, which he, he called it Chabad, Chochma Bina Das, 
is um, Chochma Bina Dasa, the intellectual faculty. And really, it's the idea that we can experience godliness through intellect, which is maybe an idea that we take for granted. I mean, being that this is a Chabad crowd, I think it's safe to say it is an idea that we all take for granted. But it's a Chiddush. We shouldn't take it for granted. It's a big Chiddush, and I'll tell you why it's a big Chiddush. Because if you're going to tell me that a person can use their intellect to study nigla de Torah, the revealed portions of the Torah, meaning like uh, the Gemara, the legalistic discussions of the sages. So I understand that, because those are discussions that lend themselves to being understood. That's the purpose of it. The purpose is you should understand it. So it makes sense to say that a, that a human mind can uh, delve into it and to glean something from it. But here's the thing. If you're going to tell me I'm going to take subjects which are totally abstract, totally spiritual, heavenly ideas, otherworldly ideas, normally the way that we respond to that kind of idea is through amunas, through faith. Precisely because... I can't wrap my mind around it, so then how do I deal with it? Through amuna, through faith. If I can't understand it, I can still have a relationship with it, but the relationship is a relationship of amuna, And that was very central to the Baal Shem Tov's teachings. The idea of amuna, amuna pshuta, simple faith. And, 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 and that this faith was inherent to every single Jewish soul. And that the scholar and the layman alike, didn't matter. Didn't matter if you had studied, you have this basic faith. To the contrary, <laughs> maybe even to a certain degree, studying could get in the way of faith because faith and, and intellect are, are, are two separate things. So the Baal Shem Tov was very... The Baal Shem Tov's whole approach was very much emphasizing the idea of simple, pure faith. Comes the Alter Rebbe and says, we're going to take these ideas, which normally all you can do with them is believe in them, and we're going to try to understand them. So do you understand how radical that is? That proposal? We're going to take ideas that Inherently, because of how deep they are, the way that we normally deal with those ideas is just by believing in them. And the Alter Rebbe comes and says, no, 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 we're going to understand them to the best of our ability as well. So you get why that's, a, why that's a novel idea. But that was the whole idea of Chabad, Chochma Bin Adas, an intellectual approach. And that's why the, the, the Alter Rebbe's teachings are very intellectual. Very deep, a lot of concepts. Not short little titles, especially after his imprisonment and his release, where his teachings became very elaborate, detailed. So you might say like this. The Baal Shem Tov came and saved the Jews by telling them that they are a beloved little baby. That they should understand that their relationship with Hashem is, this is your tati, he loves you, you don't have to understand why he's your tati, what makes him your tati, what makes you his child, all you have to know is that's tati. And that's it. And that was life-saving, and that was necessary, that was crucial, that was what was needed at that juncture. But then a little time passes, and the Alter Rebbe comes along and says, and now, Kindalach, it's time to grow up. Yes, you are still your children, your, your parents' children. And in fact, you know, as you get older, you realize 
that your parents are always going to see you as their baby to some extent. And when you have your own kids, you'll see even when they grow up and even when you're impressed with them, wow, look at this, this kid grew up and he's accomplishing so much. What a mature adult. And at the same time, you always see your kids on some level as, but this is my baby. I'm saying in a, in a good way, in a pure way, in a loving way. This is my baby. Because a parent always looks at a child, this is my baby. So you never stop being your father's beloved baby. You don't stop being the beloved baby. But what happens is you grow up and you mature, you also become an adult child. And an adult child has to have a more sophisticated relationship with his or her mother and father. It can't just be tracing your hand and make a little turkey and saying, happy birthday, I love you, Tati, and oh, it's so heartwarming. That's good for the four-year-old. But now you're an adult. Write me a letter. You want to really write a birthday card to your father, write him a letter and say specific things, intelligent things, things that take thought. Give, give thanks. Say, say things that only an adult can say. I mean, you guys are still, I'm uh, in the right time. You'll invite me to the chasana. But you guys are, you guys are, I want to tell you something. You're going to get married. You're going to have your own kids. You're going to have your own family. And you're going to be in awe of your parents. Because we cannot relate to what they do for us until, until we've had to do it for our own children. You grow up and, and, and you say to your, to your parents, thank you. Thank you for everything you did. Thank you for the sacrifices. I cannot truly fathom even what you did for us. But now that I'm trying to do this for my own children, I can begin to appreciate. That's an adult birthday card. For a father. So the Baal Shem Tov came and he told us, you are the beloved, cute, sweet, innocent, cuddly little child. And that was life-saving and we needed that. We needed that message. The Al Rebbe came along and said, and now let's also add a level of maturity to that. Let's start to learn about Tati. What makes him great? See, a little kid, he doesn't know anything about his father. He doesn't know what makes his father different from other fathers. He doesn't even necessarily know that his father is any better than, than some other kid's father. All he knows is this is his father. So when a little kid gets lost, let's say, in a crowd, and he, and he, and he, and he cries out, Tati! If you would stop him, you would say to him, hold on a second, kid. Why, do, why are you screaming out Tati? Maybe there are other fathers, better fathers. Who's, <laughs> who says you want this guy that brought you? Maybe you, get, maybe you upgrade. Maybe you get another father. No. All he knows is this is Tati. Well, why? Why is this Tati? Because this is Tati. You understand? <laughs> he has a muna. It's not intellectual. It's just pure. This is Tati. Well, why is Tati Tati? Because he's Tati. <laughs> and... and, and and that's like the pure, simple faith that a Jew has in Hashem. Well, why is Hashem Hashem? I don't know, because he is. Now, why are you a Jew? I don't know, because I am, right? That was the pshitas, the simplicity, the Baal Shem Tov loved. The Baal Shem Tov loved the simple Jews, the Anoshem Shotim. Because they don't complicate it. <laughs> What's the difference between a, uh, a simple Jew and a complicated Jew, right? A simple Jew has clarity. He has clarity. Yes, no, black and white. It's very clear to him. Complicated Jew, everything is uh, gray. <laughs> I remember when we used to go on Mivtzayim on Friday afternoons when I was a Bachar learning here in Crown Heights. And as you know, Friday afternoons, they uh, shut down the yeshiva, they closed the lights. You're supposed to go out and uh, go on uh, Mivtoyim, the, the Rebbe's mitzvah campaigns. So I had a spot in uh, Manhattan, uptown. And I remember one time, 
conversation I had with a guy. Excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? Right, that's how we would, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? And the non-Jews would always say, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. You're beautiful the way God made you. You don't have to be sorry. <laughs> no, nothing to be sorry. No apologies needed. Uh, and then the Jews would always, you know, I don't know. Yeah, so, well, sometimes, yes, yes. Would you like to put on film? Sure. You know, once in a while. Once in a while. But... Uh, a lot of times, I remember, I just, I remember this one, one time, and I asked this guy, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? And he looked at me like he's kind of grimacing. And I'm like, are you Jewish? He's like, well, it depends what you mean by that. And uh, I'm like, I, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm here to help Jews to do, to do mitzvahs. I, uh, just asking you if you're Jewish. He's like... Well, you know, I'm not really practicing. I was for a while, but, you know, I do culturally, I do identify uh, with the aspirations of the Jewish community, but with certain exceptions, um, you know, politically, I'm not always so sure about. And this whole long, I, I, I said to the guys, you know what, I don't even have to ask the question anymore. You're definitely Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> like this, no question here. You, you're Jewish, but see, the Baal Shem Tov loved the simplicity, the clarity, the simple faith. Tati is Tati. Why? What makes him Tati? Because he is right. So what makes Hashem great? I don't know. Because he's Hashem. How did he become Hashem? I don't know. He just is Hashem. He has no answers. And there's a beauty to that. We shouldn't put it down. Don't put it down. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's pure. It's sincere. And in fact, it's the foundation because the Baal Shem Tov came before the Alter Rebbe, not the Alter Rebbe before the Baal Shem Tov. Remember that. The Baal Shem Tov had to first come and let us know that we're beautiful, sweet, delightful, cute little babies who know nothing about what makes Tati Tati, and then the, the, the Alter Rebbe could come and say, let's grow up and let's start to learn about Tati. Don't just tell me Tati is Tati. Tell me something about Tati. Iumamali kol almin, v'sevet kol almin. Tell me about him. He infuses all reality. He transcends all reality. He is infinite. He creates the world at every single second. All, all created existence is ontologically dependent upon his absolute existence. Intelligent stuff. Talk to me about who your father is. And that's what Chassidus Chabad is. Chassidus Chabad is the Alter Rebbe talking to Jews as grown-up children of their father and saying, let's learn a little bit about what makes our father so great. Let's understand a little bit. And that's why we learn things like Seder Ishtalslis, you know, the orderly progression of how infinite everythingness gives rise to finite creation. That's an important thing to understand if you want to appreciate your Tati in an intelligent, grown-up, mature way. And we learn about cosmology, the origins of existence. How created reality arises something out of absolute nothing at every single second. The mechanics of that. Why is that important to know? Because that's what your Tati does. You, would, you should know about it. You should, do you know what he does for a living? <laughs> like a four-year-old, you ask him, what, what does your Tati do for a living? He has no clue. What? <laughs> but an adult should understand this is what your father does. And have a little bit of a, a respect. Wow, that's impressive. 
Like, yeah, I love my father because he's my father. But I want to tell you, in addition to that, here's some impressive stuff that he does. You understand? That's the difference between the Baal Shem Tov's teachings and the Alter Rebbe's teachings. The Baal Shem Tov's teachings are, I love my father because he's my father, and I don't know anything more than that. That's it. The Alter Rebbe's teachings are, tell me something intelligent about your father. Talk to me about God in intelligent language. Tell me something about this, this Hashem that's so important to you in your life. Talk to me about him. Tell me, tell me, what does he do? What is the nature of his existence? Now, the sweet little cute little kid is going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Nature of existence. I don't, Tati is Tati. But the grown up better be able to answer that question. And when I ask you as adults, seminary is adults, right? Yeah. In theory, at least. When I ask you, speak to me intelligently about the greatness of God. You should be able to do that, especially as Chabad Chassidim, who were given a language, a language, a lexicon for discussing the The unspeakable. I mean, that's really what Chassidus Chabad is. It's a language for communicating the unspeakable. Because it's taking ideas that used to not be transmittable in any type of intellectual way. You just had to take it on faith. And it gives it language so you can talk about it intelligently. Now, here's another thing, another layer. You ready to go another layer deeper? Yeah? So far, so good? About Chabad? Chabad is a language for discussing that which, at one point at least, was not something you could discuss. If you know, you know, and if you don't, I can't tell you. And by the way, that's what it says. If you look in the Rambam, for instance, when he talks about Maisemer Kava, which are the Kabbalistic secrets that were handed down throughout the generations. And it was very uh, limited who got to know these secrets. It was not, this was long before Chsidis. Chsidis came and revealed the secrets and made them public property. But uh, for thousands of years, before Chsidis, these secrets, Soides HaToyda, the secrets, the mystical teachings of the Torah, were kept very, very under wraps. And uh, like the Rambam says in Hilchis Yisoyde HaToyda, that the concepts of Maisim Merkava, which are basically the, the mystical inner workings of the universe, would only be taught to one person in a generation, and even him, you only tell him if he understands it already. Like, <laughs> anyone who has to have it spelled out for him, he's not ready. He's not ready to hear it. So who gets to hear these things? I mean, like, really, the, the elite of the elite of the elite. Comes along the al Rebbe and says, we're going to take these ideas that used to be considered totally inaccessible, and we're going to make it that any intelligent person who knows how to carry a conversation, I mean, obviously, you have to have some level of intelligence. But if you're an intelligent person, if you can learn another subject, lahavdil, then you can learn this. And then you can have a language for discussing things that historically, in the past, people couldn't discuss because there was no language for it. You just had to believe in it. That's a pretty wild concept. You know, one of the things the 
It says in Hayyim Yim that uh, before Ksidis, specifically before the Alter Rebbe, there was a teacher and there were students. And the Rebbe is given Elant, the Tal Talmidim is given Elant. The teacher was lonely and the students were lonely. And then there came the Alter Rebbe, that Alter Rebbe had Ufkaton. The Alter Rebbe accomplished that the Rebbe is no longer lonely and the students are no longer lonely. What does that mean? That they used to be lonely, but now they're not lonely. And why was it the Alter Rebbe? So I'll tell you an interesting explanation. Imagine there's somebody who sees what nobody else sees. Somebody who can look at reality not as another created being within creation, but from a creator's perspective, from a, a godly perspective. And these are the rare, holy people who we stand in awe of and we, we, we refer to their way of looking at the world that with, with, with names like uh, Ruach HaKodesh, Nevoa. They see what no one else sees. Imagine how incredibly lonely it would be to be such a person. Because not only you see what people don't see, you see what other people are incapable of even imagining. So you have nobody to talk to. Imagine before Tehidus Achsidus existed, you would have no language to communicate your inner world to anyone other than yourself and maybe you'll find maybe you'll find an inner circle of people other tzaddikim maybe if you're lucky but your students definitely not your students the masses for sure not the masses so basically you have this experience of, of, of life which is totally unrelatable and so the Rebbe was lonely came the Alter Rebbe and with Chassidus Chabad gave a language to be able to intelligently discuss that which heretofore had been completely undiscussable. It was just something you had to relate to on faith. And now, the Rebbe is no longer lonely. And his Talmidim, his students, are no longer lonely. Because he can actually describe to you what he sees. When we're learning chassidus, that's what we're learning. We're learning a report on reality from somebody who sees reality from a completely different level, which in and of itself, by the way, even if such a tzaddik exists and never teaches you, that, that itself could inspire you. You could say, wow, look, there's a person who sees the world from such an elevated, holy perspective. That itself is inspiring. But Chassidus Chabad is, no, don't just be inspired by it. Don't just be impressed by it. Now listen to this tzaddik. He's going to describe to you what he sees, and you're going to get it. And what does it mean you're going to get it? That's going to become the way you see the world, too. Is that wild? So something that a tzaddik used to not even be able to tell anyone else, now we can learn it, and it can become the way we look at life, too. So that's, you're asking, the, what, what's the Chabad thing? That's the Chabad. That's the Chabad. Okay, but right before you mentioned Chabad, I said, are you ready to go another level? Okay, so we go another level? All right. So one of the things that the Alter Rebbe did for us is he said, now that you know that you're the beloved sweet child who loves Tati because Tati is Tati, and Munapshuta, simple, sincere faith, the Alter Rebbe says, now we're going to grow up. We're going to be adult children who can speak intelligently about our father. 
Talk to me about this great God and how he creates and how he expresses his will in the mitzvahs and what his plan is for creation. And talk to me about Mashiach and Dira B'tach and all these concepts that we take for granted when we learn Chassidus Chabad. Okay, great. Now I want to go another level. Chassidus Chabad not only enables us to speak intelligently about the greatness of Tati, but also, and perhaps maybe even more important, Siddhis Chabad gives us a language to be able to speak intelligently about the greatness of ourselves. Tehidus of Hashem lets us know that we are beloved. Unconditionally so. But Torah's Chabad gives us intelligent language for understanding and be able, being able to explain why that is so. What makes us beloved? What makes us important? What makes our value unconditional and inherent? And that's an incredible gift. That we have the ability to explain why our existence is worthy. So <laughs> you have to have both. You have to have Baal Shem Tov and Al Terebe. You have to have both. So you have, first you have to have just a little child's simple, innocent certainty that, yes, I am important. You know why? Because my Tati told me I'm important. Because when he comes home, he smiles when he sees me. So I must be important. That's beautiful. That's Tere Sabal Shem Tov. How do I know I'm important? Because when Tati sees me, he hugs me and he smiles and... He's happy to see me. So I must be important. That's Teir Sabal Shem. Teir Chabad, the Alter Rebbe's Teir, is I could actually explain to you what makes my existence so important. And it's not arrogance. It's not, it's not gaiva. It's not that I'm conceited. I'm full of myself. No, I'm just telling you a fact. This is the nature of my existence. And by the way, I don't think I'm unique. It's not like I'm lording this over you and saying, I'm special, you're not. Because after all, <laughs> that which makes me inherently worthy is the same thing that makes you inherently worthy, is the presence of that neshama. So there's no elitism here. It's not like I'm trying to get one over on you. No, it's just having the ability to communicate our own worth. And primarily, do you know which listener it is the most important to be able to communicate your own worth to? To yourself. And particularly, let's use the Hasidic lexicon that the Alter Rebbe gave us to speak about this intelligently. What aspect of yourself needs to hear this message? What do we call it? Nefesh Bahamas, right. The animal soul. So the animal soul needs to hear <clears throat> in relatable terms that he's not unworthy. That he's not a loser. He has to hear that he's inherently valid. And that the infinite one takes pride in him. And you know, <laughs> we need to be able to do it on this level of, of Chabad because if you do it just on a simple level, the Baal Shem Tov's level, and you just you tell your own animal soul, oh, stop with the stinking thinking, stop with the negative self-talk. Come on, we're not worthless. He says to you, how do you know? <laughs> and you say, ah, we, I just know, I believe it. And he's like, eh, you don't really, you don't really know. But if you understand it, according to Teres Chabad, with Chochmah Bin Adas, you say to your animal soul, I don't know. I don't know. 
You're telling me I couldn't explain it? Sit down, my friend. I will talk to you for so long, you're going to regret that you invited me to give you this lecture. I will tell you very articulately why I'm important, why I'm beloved, why my existence matters. So one of the most important things that the Al Rebbe gave us when he gave us this mystical language is the ability to actually understand this idea of our own greatness, which really is a really deep spiritual idea not something that on our own we would be able to figure out. Um, historically, throughout the generations, it wasn't something that people really knew about. They were healthier, so they didn't need to know about it. You understand, Chassidus was revealed on a need-to-know basis, and it was revealed bit by bit in stages. As we were more desperate for it, more of the secrets became revealed. So we're at the point where we really do need to be able to speak confidently and articulately, primarily to ourselves, about what makes our existence worthy. One of the things that we know is that Hashem embodied himself, so to speak, in order to have a relationship, period, in order to have a relationship. If Hashem is everything, how can he have a relationship? You ever thought about that before? If Hashem is everything, ain't Eid Milvadai, how can he have a relationship? Hmm? We're not a separate entity of, from him. Yeah, yeah. So when Hashem relates to us, it's really him relating to himself. Say it louder. Oh, he knows, he created us, he knows us, so it's not that hard for him to relate to us. Okay, I, I, I guess if that's the way you define relating, meaning to understand what makes somebody tick. You're right, it's much easier for him to know what makes us tick than it is for us to figure out what makes him tick. But that, that's not what I mean by a relationship. Um, you know, a psychologist can study somebody and understand what makes them tick. It doesn't mean they have a real relationship. A real relationship is uh, an interdependence where you, you create something together. You're on a mission together. How can Hashem be in a relationship if He's everything and all? Then there's no one to relate to. There's no one to partner with. So Hashem otherizes himself, so to speak, into you and reunites with himself through his relationship with you. Which is what every marriage really is. That's why the best metaphor for the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people is a marriage metaphor. King Solomon was the wisest of all men. And when he wanted to have the best possible metaphor to, to describe our relationship with Hashem, he wrote Shir Hashirim, which is a love poem. He wrote it as a marriage. What's a marriage? 
Think about what happened. You have Adam Arishon. Adam was not the first man. Adam doesn't mean man. Ish is a man. Ish is a man. Isha is a woman. Adam is an earthling from the Adama. And then Hashem looked at this earthling, this being, who was totally self-sufficient. And trust me when I say his life was a lot simpler. And he said it's not good for him to be alone. So he split this being into two, into man and to woman. And then he said, now cleave together and become one flesh. Hold on a second. You had one, you said, no, it's not good, let's make two. You have two, and you said, no, no, become one. Why did Hashem do this to the first human? By the way, the word human is one of those words in English that is precise. Human comes from the same root as... Um, you know what humus is? You ever do gardening and work with humus? Humus is dirt. Human means from the dirt, like the Adam is from the Adama. It's also from the, the same root as humility. When you, ex you accept the fact that I was made from the dirt, that's called humility, which is also a sense of humor, when you can laugh at yourself. So Hashem took this human, and he made him two, and he said, now become one because he wanted to imprint in our psyche his experience, Hashem's own experience. What is Hashem's experience? That everythingness, so to speak, separates himself into otherness, creator and creation, infinite and finite, and then says, now let's reunite and become one again which will ultimately happen when Mashiach comes, and we'll see how creator and creation are one, the infinite and the finite are one, the soul and the body are one. So really, this is the metaphor. Marriage is the metaphor for Hashem's relationship with us. Yeah. Yeah. Question is, the point of a marriage is to be fruitful and multiply. Pruravu. So what's the pruravu? The pruravu, what does it say uh, about uh, these are the offspring of Nayak, Elatelis Nayak. That the offspring of the righteous are my their good deeds. That also means literal children, because one of the good deeds, one of the six hundred thirteen commandments, at least for men is to have children, to have a boy and a girl who have each a boy and a girl. But if you're asking what are the offspring of our marriage with Hashem, it's the good that we do in this world. It's a partnership. And that's what the Dira B'tachtenim is, by the way. When we speak about Dira B'tachtenim, Hashem wanted a dwelling place in the lower realm. What do you think that means? That means he wants to marry his wife, and they should live together in a home that she sets up for him. He could go and live in some bachelor pad. He could rent an apartment in Manhattan. That's not what he wants. He wants his wife to make a home for him, and he should move into it. The home is the world that we, the wife, and I include myself as a wife, because all Jews are wives to Hashem. You know, I was once at a retreat, and uh, this woman interrupted me, and I forgot what I was speaking about, but she, she says to me, um, why do you keep calling God him? And I said, because he's my husband. And she got like a little bit uh, taken aback. I said, yeah, it's true, he's my husband. 
And I said, you know, it's, it's interesting because my wife gets to be a wife all the time. Because down here in her terrestrial marriage, she's a wife. And then also with Hashem, she's a wife, because all Jewish people are wives to Hashem. I said, for me, it's very confusing, because with my wife, I'm a husband, but with my husband, I'm a wife. And that's why I, as a man, have to constantly be reminded that I'm a wife. That's why I have to say, Shalaya Sani Isha in the morning. A woman doesn't have to remind herself that. You know what I mean, Shalaya Sani Isha? The double meaning. Shalay with an Aleph, Shalay with a Vav. Shalaya Sani Isha. He didn't make me a woman. Shalay with a Vav. He made me his woman. He made me his wife. Because I'm not a biological woman, I have to constantly remind myself every day that I'm his woman. I'm his wife. And that's why also I put on tefillin. Women don't have to put on tefillin. I need the tefillin to feminize myself. When a man puts on tefillin, do you know the bias? The, the box is supposed to be like a, a, like a womb, like a uterus. And the ritzua, the, the strap, is supposed to be like an umbilical cord. And then when you wrap the, 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 the strap around your finger, it's supposed to be like a tabash shel kiddushin, like a marriage, an, enga an engagement ring. And that's why before you do it, you say, asher kiddushonu b'mitzvesam. He who sanctified, kiddushonu is like the word kiddushin, chupi v'kiddushin. The word for marriage in, in, in Jewish tradition is kiddushin. Asher kiddushonu b'mitzvesam. He who married me, not just he who made me holy. Asher kiddushonu, he who made me holy, he who married me, betrothed me with his mitzvahs. So the whole thing is about, is about marriage. You know, in Shir Hashirim, it says, uh, you guys probably know this line. It's a famous line in Shir Hashirim because it's also a nigan from the Alter Rebbe. But uh, the Kail Deidi Doifik, right? So the, in, in that line in, in Shir Hashirim, Hashem refers to the Jewish people as tamosi. Tamosi, the word tam means whole, complete. means my complete one. It's a compliment. Um, but the Medrash, Rabbah, says tamosi is toimosi. You know what toimim are? What? Twins. Right. Anyone else here born in Sivan? Yeah? Gemini? Gemini? Who else is born in Sivan? If you're born in Sivan, twins. Right. The sign for Sivan is Gemini, is the twins. Not the Minnesota twins. Not the Gemini. The so the Medrash Abba says, Hashem says to the Jewish people, you are my twin. This isn't from Chassidus, not from Kabbalah, this is from Medrash, from Chazal. That Hashem calls the Jewish people his twin. It's a wild concept, huh? So who are you? How could you not embrace your absolute worth if you understand even partially what it means to be an extension of God's own existence. Just like his existence is absolute and needs no validation, Hashem doesn't need anyone to give him permission to exist, so too that is the nature of, nature of your existence. You do not need anyone to give you permission to exist, so stop apologizing for your existence. And stop being self-conscious. And stop being full of shame. Stop asking people for validation so that you can feel that you finally belong and you're finally worthy. You don't need it. You know why? Because your existence is as absolutely and unconditionally worthy as Hashem's own existence. Bam. Now, can we go another layer? Yeah? One more layer? Okay. As I understand, you're going tomorrow to the oil. That's incredible. If you are not from New York and you've come here to New York for the year, 
definitely take advantage of your proximity to the oil as much as possible. If you're from New York, I'll tell you that also. However much you may have been taking advantage of it, do it more. You don't realize, I say you don't realize because I don't think it's possible for any of us to sufficiently realize what we have access to. But I want to tell you a little bit about what it is. Um, the Alter Rebbe used to refer to the Baal Shem Tov as Der Zede. He called him the grandfather. And the simple explanation is that the Alter Rebbe, well, I mentioned it earlier, so let's uh, quiz you real quick. The Alter Rebbe was a student of the Magid. And the Magid was the student of the Baal Shem Tov. So the Alter Rebbe's teacher's teacher is like a father's father, it's like a, a grandfather. So if he considered the Magid his spiritual father, he considered the Baal Shem Tov his spiritual grandfather. Okay. The Baal Shem Tov had a grandson named Reb Baruch Mezhebozer. And Reb Baruch was a contemporary of the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe was known to tell the Rebbe Boruch, you are the biological grandson, du bist der Enikel begashmia, but I am the spiritual grandson, ich bin der Enikel beruchnis. And he meant it, le Malyusa, he meant it like he was, he was proud of it, he was saying, you may be the biological grandson, but I have something even better. I'm so grateful to be able to, to claim being the spiritual grandson. The Rebbe asks a question. The Rebbe asks a question that after you hear the question, if you know a little bit of chassidus, you wonder how in the world you're going to answer such a question because it's, it's so obvious after you hear the question. Chassidus explains that there is no closer relationship than physical, biological kin, kinship. And it explains it very clearly. Because what's transmitted in the blood I'm talking in a physical, hereditary relationship, is the essence. And he explains very clearly. The Gemara speaks about, for instance, the possibility of somebody who is a chochem ben shoyta, a wise man, the son of a fool. OK, that could happen. But no, the Gemara explains he, he inherited his wisdom from his father, the fool. Well, how did he get wisdom from his father if his father wasn't wise? And the explanation is because even if the father didn't have access to it, it could be that deep down in his essence he had it. And then when he has a son, the son gets it because a son doesn't just get what the father had access to. The son gets the deepest essence of the father, even potentials that the father himself never revealed. And, and that's how you can see a glimpse of it, the, 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 the physical relationship, or to use the Hasidic uh, jargon, that the etzim is nimshuch in gashmias. That essence is carried specifically through the medium of physicality. Which is also, not to get into a side conversation, why Hashem wants a dwelling in the physical world, and he wants mitzvahs to be performed with our physical bodies, with physical objects. Not in heaven. 
not symbolically or spiritually, but concretely in the physical world. But at, at any rate, that's a side point. The point is, the relationship between a biological father and son is etzim. Etzim. Etzim means essence. In contrast, the relationship between a teacher and a student, and again, I'll use the technical term, is a ha'ara seichel ba'alma. It's just an emanation of intellect. It's not the essence. It's not the essence. And it's very easy to explain what I mean that it's not the essence. First of all, what the teacher tells the student is not everything the teacher knows. Surely there's greater depth that the teacher himself understands that he's not capable of expressing, or he's not certain he should express. So not everything the teacher teaches is everything the teacher has inside. That's first of all. But then secondly, not everything the teacher even teaches does the student hear or understand or retain. So think about the, the potential for breaking, you know like the, the, the broken telephone game you play with your kids? So a teacher to a student, he's not giving his essence, he's giving an approximation. He's giving like a glimmer of some aspect of himself and by the time it reaches to the student, it's, it's, it's like a copy of a copy. But the father to a son, that's Edson. And that's where those genes, they carry everything. Even if the father himself didn't have access to it, that's why the, the fool could, could bequeath wisdom to his son, even though the fool himself didn't have access to the, to the wisdom. A teacher can't teach wisdom to a student if the teacher doesn't speak the wisdom. But a father could actually bequeath the capacity for wisdom to a child, even if the father himself never had access to that capacity for wisdom. You understand the, the contrast? So the Rebbe asks a question. How in the world is the Alter Rebbe telling Rebbe Baruch Mezhubaj, oh, you're only the biological descendant, I'm the spiritual descendant. If you learn a little bit of Chassidus, it's pretty clear that a biological descendant is a much deeper connection than a student. Okay, so we want to hear the answer? It says in the Medrash, Medrash Rus Raba, Tzadikim Demim Lebeiram. Tzadikim resemble their creator. How did Tzadikim resemble their creator? Well, I'd imagine many ways, but in this particular Medrash, and in this particular context, the Rebbe explains it to mean that just like Hashem, when he gave us the Torah, did not give us a book that he wrote, but he gave us himself in book form. Follow? Torah is not a book written by Hashem. Torah is Hashem himself in the medium of the book. And that's why the first word of the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God, the first word in the in Lashon HaKadosh, in the Holy Tongue, is Anoichi. Anoichi is the pronoun, I. And as the, uh, as the Enyankiv explains, Anoichi is Rosh is an acronym. Ano, Nashi, Savis, Yehovis. Hashem says, I wrote myself and gave myself through this medium of Torah. So Torah is not a book written by Hashem. Torah is the medium through which Hashem actually gives us himself. And that's why, as the Zayar says, Hashem and his Torah are entirely one entity. So just like Hashem was able to transmit his essence through his teachings, so too tzaddikim have this capacity to transmit their essence through their teachings. So 
when you have a relationship with a tzaddik. It's not just, oh, I heard a teaching, I was inspired. Let me repeat it for you. That's a regular teacher-student relationship. This is much deeper than a regular teacher-student relationship. This is more like, and in fact, in many ways, surpasses a father-child relationship. And what does it mean, a father-child relationship? That the DNA of the father is the essence of the child. So to have a relationship with a tzaddik doesn't just mean that I was inspired by his teachings. It actually means to discover that your deepest self is identical with the tzaddik. When you go to the oil, you are not going there to pay your respects to a great Jewish leader. You're going there to encounter your own essence. You're going there for Yechidus. Yechidus is a one-on-one -on -one audience with the Rebbe, how they used to call it. And at the oil is Yechidus. Yechidus is Moloshin Yechida. Yechida means the essence. You know, the five levels of the soul, the nefesh, which animates our, our physicality, and then the ruach, which is the energy of the emotions, and the neshama, which is the energy of the intellect, then chaya, which animates our, our spiritual uh, transcendent life, and then yechida, yechida is the essence. So yechidos, the one-on-one -on -one encounter with the tzaddik, is the encounter with your own yechida, with your own essence. So if you have an opportunity <laughs> to be your deepest, truest self, I would recommend that you take that opportunity as often as possible. You know, usually, if you wait for it to happen in time, you know, there's time and there's place. Elam shon of a nefesh, the temporal and the, uh, the spatial and the, the human. So if you wait for it to happen in time, there's one day a year where you are your truest, deepest self. It's called Yim Kippur, Achas Bishana. The one day a year where you are truly yourself, and that's why we daven five tefillahs, five prayers, because the Yechida comes out, and that's why you do Tshuva and Yim Kippur. That's how Kapora, that's how atonement works. Oh, by the way, that's the other word the English got right. I said human is a good word in English, so is atonement. You know what atonement is, etymologically? At one minute. And that's what it really is that when you realize you're one with Hashem, then everything that you did wrong falls away because that wasn't the real you. That was on your external layers that they just fall away. When you're at one with Hashem, you're pristine, you're perfect. All over again. And nothing you did on the, the levels of nefesh, ruach, neshama, and even of chaya can touch it. So, Yim Kippur is the one time a year we experience our true self. But also, you can have Yim Kippur anytime you want. You go to the oil and you have Yechidus, and you can experience your true self. Yeah? How do you feel it? Here's the beauty of it. You don't have to. In fact, feeling it may even be a distraction. Because here's the deal. When I have an experience, something intense happens to me, then I feel it. But this isn't something happening to you. This is you are the happening. You're not having an experience. You are the experience. So it, it almost is impossible to feel it because feel what? This is your essence. You are it. You're not encountering it. 
You're not beholding it, observing it. You are being it. You're it. How does the sun look at itself? If you want, the option is available, you can have a subject-object relationship with a tzaddik. And you can be impressed with the tzaddik, and you can behold the tzaddik, you can look up to the tzaddik. That relationship is available. What I'm informing you is, if you want to go deeper, you can realize there's nothing to look at. There's nothing to observe. You're not looking for anything anymore. You are it. You always were. You always were. You always were everything you were looking for. There's a, one of my favorite Yechida stories. There was a young guy. Hmm? We're not the tzaddik? We're not the tzaddik? The essence of the child is the DNA of the father. Look deeply and you will find the tzaddik is not someone other than you. The tzaddik is your truest self. His kashras is not hero worship. His kashras is the facilitation of self-discovery to reveal your own godliness. That's why any time you left from the Rebbe's presence, he gave you a job to do. <laughs> because you can't meet the Rebbe and leave without being informed of how great your mission is in this world. You know that it was Gordon Zacks from Bexley, Ohio. But he hadn't seen the Rebbe in almost 20 years. He had a Yechidus. And then almost 20 years later, he came to the Rebbe's house in 1988 after the Rebbe passed away and the Rebbe was giving dollars in his house. And the Rebbe saw him and within a half a second recognized him and continued the conversation that they'd been having almost 20 years earlier. And he starts laughing. It's on video. You can watch it. And he says, oh, you're amazing. And the Rebbe says, what will be the value to the community if I'm amazing? Like, what, what, what value is it that you're impressed with me? What did the Rebbe want Gordon Zacks to do, by the way? <laughs> he wanted him to create a foundation, an endowment for Jewish education. And that's what the Rebbe told him after he saw him 19 years later. He says, by the way, remember when we were speaking? It's like, imagine, you haven't seen somebody in 19 years. Forget about the fact they've aged. It's like... <laughs> Yesef at Tzaddik's brothers couldn't even recognize him. But the Rebbe sees him, and he continues the conversation exactly where they had left off. He says, what are you doing for Jewish education? He was trying to get him to, get, to make a, an endowment, I think a $100 million endowment for, uh, for Jewish education. In other words, don't come and tell me how great I am. I'm not interested. This is what the Rebbe is saying. I want you to understand how great you are. Get to work. One of my favorite Yechidah stories, which I was about to tell you, is, um, is uh, Freddie Hager, Ephraim Hager, Oliver Shalom, from London. He was in his 20s, he was a young guy, not a Lababacha, and uh, Shluchim schlepped him to, to Crown Heights, and he had Yechidahs with the Rebbe at 3 in the morning. And uh, I'll tell you the punchline first. Then, if you want, I'll tell you what led up to it. But he was in Yechidahs with the Rebbe, he came out, and he said, I was not properly prepared for my, my encounter with the Rebbe. I entered thinking I was going to meet a great man, and I left realizing that I had met my true self. And by the way, what did the Rebbe tell him in that Yechidus? The Rebbe actually told him to become a Rebbe. <laughs> yeah, the whole story, I won't tell it now, but he told him to become a Rebbe. And he told him, what is a rabbit? He asked him, 
three times. I said, Vos is a Rebbe. Vos is a Rebbe. Vos is a Rebbe. And then the Rebbe explained, The Eshter Rebbe is going to be the Baal First, Chesidish Rebbe was the Baal Shem Tov. Als was er hot gehad by zich in Stub, at the Rebbe gegeben jede nach far legen zich schlafen. Everything he had of value in his house, he would give it away every night before he would go to sleep. Ados is a Rebbe, that's a Rebbe. It's interesting, because the way the Rebbe defined the Rebbe is not, you know, he wears a streimel, a fertatish. A Rebbe is just somebody who's selfless and he's there for others. So the Rebbe told Freddie Hager to become a Rebbe. I think he did actually become a Rebbe, the way the Rebbe defines the Rebbe. Not, you know, you should uh, go uh, open up a shtibel <coughs> in Borough Park and uh, find some chsidim. Becoming a rebbe the way the Lubavitcher Rebbe defines a rebbe is whatever your capacity is, whether you're a businessman. Fre Freddie Hager was, a, he was a chairman of the London Diamond Bourse. I mean, you're in business, you're in education, you drive an Uber, you, whatever you do, but be a rebbe. Be a rebbe. Be there selflessly for others. That's how the rebbe defined rebbe. Jonathan Sachs, all of a sudden, says, you know, great, uh, good leaders make followers, great leaders make leaders, the Rebbe made leaders. I, that's the Balabatish way of saying it. The real way, the Chassidish way of saying it, the honest way of saying it, the Rebbe made Rebbes. No question, 100%, the Rebbe made Rebbes. The Rebbe said of the Fetish, but the Shani Rabbe touched on Aleph, the Rebbe said, every single Jew is an Admur. An Admur, Adinene Marene Verabeno. That's the title that's used for a Rebbe. The Rebbe said, every single Jew is an Admur. And the Rebbe knew what he was talking about. He knew what that title meant. The Rebbe came to teach us how great we are. Every mimer, every sicha that you learn from the Rebbe, if you don't come away from it cherishing yourself and respecting yourself in a new light, you didn't learn it properly. And for sure, if you come away from it feeling in inadequate, you definitely didn't learn it properly. I, I had a teacher, one of my mashpiyim, in yeshiva. He was a little kid back in the good old days when every little bar mitzvah bacher had yechidus with the rabbi. So he had a bar mitzvah yechidus with the rabbi. Can you imagine that? A little 13-year-old kid being able to have bar mitzvah yechidus. So he asked his teacher, who was Rabbi Yoel, Rabbi Yoel Khan, all of a shalom. The yard site was just recently. His first yard site was just recently. So the bar mitzvah boy asks Rabbi Yoel, when I go into the rabbi, how should I conduct myself? How should I conduct myself? So Rabbi El says to him in the, like the sharp Russian style, he says, no, nah, never mind, I'll go and study you. So he's like, no, 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 I'm just asking, how do I conduct myself when I'm in the, in the Rebbe's room, in the, in the Yechidus? He's like, yeah, I told you, I'll go and study you. So he's like, no, I'm just asking, yeah, I'll go and study you. So finally the kid just says, you know, tell me, what am I asking, what, just, what am I saying wrong? Just, just tell me. So Rabbi El then he tells him, like, he says, Gantz Elam Haze is an Alma de Shikra. This world, the physical world, is a false world. It's interesting, by the way. Usually when we say that Elam Haze, the phenomenological universe, the physical plane, is an Alma de Shikra, is a false world, what we mean is things aren't what they seem. You see the table instead of seeing the Dvar Hashem, the divine speech which is enlivening. Normally that's when we say the world is a false world. We mean things aren't what they seem. We see creator instead of creation. We should really see both. But what Rabbi Yale meant, apparently is from context, this world's an Alma de Shikr, is a false world, not just because things aren't what they seem, but we are not what we seem. Even to ourselves. We don't see the truth about ourselves. We have a false self-concept. We have an idea of who we are that's based on the lies of the, the nefshabamis, of the animal soul, wrapped in shame and inadequacy. 
and we, we don't realize that we are an embodiment of eloquence, of godliness. We don't realize who we are. So Rabbi El says to the kid, listen to the punchline. This whole world is an alma de shikra, it's a false world. And in the false world, there's one, he called it, Dalit Ames Shel Emes. The one four cubits of truth, the one little place of, of truth. And what he meant by truth is not just that things finally are as they really are, but he meant primarily here, you are who you really are. You are your true self. You are your true self. There's one place, he meant, in Yechidah, in the Rebbe's room, when you're standing in front of the tzaddik, and your Yechidah is nisgale, your truest, deepest, infinite, eternal, absolute existence becomes revealed to you. So that's when you are the real you. So, so Rabbi El says to the kid, and the, in the whole false world, there's one place where you are the real you. And in the one place where you are the real you, you're asking me to tell you how to conduct yourself? That's why I said I'll go in instead of you. <laughs> like, it defeats the whole purpose. You want to put on an act? The rest of our lives we're acting. We're constantly acting. We're acting to ourselves. The self-deception is... It's worse than even what we're doing to others, the way we, 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 we lie to ourselves. And I'm not talking about the, the delusions of grandeur, I'm talking about the opposite. The delusions of inadequacy. That we convince ourselves that we're something less than an infinite, eternal, godly being. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. We existed before the world was created. You want to hear a word? I don't think the world is ready for this. Last week's parsha was Kiseitse. Kiseitse el melchoma aloi vecho. So how does Chassidus explain that pasuk? The first verse in the, in the last week's Torah portion. Chassidus explains that this is speaking about the soul. When you, the soul, go out, where? From heaven. To war. Where's war? The battlefield. This physical world. You're going to be in a body and you have temptations, distractions. That's how Chassidus explains it. The Rebbe asks a question. Rashi says on that verse, This verse is speaking about an optional war. You know there were optional wars and obligatory wars. A milchemes mitzvah is a war you have to fight, like a Amalek, let's say. That's not an option. It's one of the six, 613 commandments. Then Milchem Eshushus is the king goes to the Sanhedrin and they declare war. And they don't have to. He decides strategically that it's, uh, they're going to declare war, but it's not a mitzvah to, to, to fight that particular war. So in context, Rashi says that verse, Kiseitse, El Milchoma, is an optional war. So the Rebbe asks a bombshell question. How in the world can you tell me that this verse that Chassidus says is talking about Yeridas HaNeshama, the descent of the soul into a body, is coming from a verse that in context is an optional situation. Your soul had an option? You were forced into embodiment. So you're telling me that your soul coming down to the world was optional, doesn't seem very optional. So listen what the Rebbe says. The Madras says, when Hashem created, he consulted before he created. But who did he consult? With whom did he consult? So it says, Benishmei Sam Shel Tzadikim. He consulted the, the neshamas of the righteous. And the Rebbe says, Va'ameich kulam tzadikim, which is the, what the, the Navi says. That all of your people are righteous. So when Hashem created, who did he get advice from? From you. <laughs> he spoke to you. He said, hey, should we do this? 
Now, you don't remember that. Yeah, because it was a long time ago. And you were in a very different state back then. But the real you. And you continue being the real. That real you is still the real you, even though it's covered in layers and layers of stuff. But that's what Chassidus is. Chassidus is to remind us who the real you really is so you can start digging it out and getting in touch with it. So when Hashem created the world, he consulted the neshamas and said, should we do this? And they said, yes. So basically, your embodiment was optional, and you opted in. You clicked. Yes, I read the terms and conditions. Let's go for it. Yes, I want the app. So for us to view ourselves as puny little created beings, we're, we're, we're missing the whole mature relationship with Hashem and with ourselves that Chassidus makes possible. The al Rebbe came, and in a manner of Chabad, of intelligent faith, gave us articulate language, rooted in Chazal. All of these ideas, they all trace back to Gemara, to Madrash, to Zayar. None of this is his innovation. But he gave us a language, he gave us a, a vocabulary for being able to actually have these discussions. So I can sit here and I can say to a room full of, how, how old are you guys, 18, 19? Okay, I can say to a room full of 18, 19 year old young ladies, secrets that in the past were not even known by the, the greatest rabbis with the white beards. I can tell you these secrets, that the real essential you your true identity is godliness. And that you existed before creation. And that you are more creator than creation. And that you're not just down here within the creation as just another created being. You're experiencing that, yeah, because that's the embodiment mission that you're on. So we have that sort of double duty that we're pulling where we have that perspective of being in creation. But we're, we're in creation, but we're not of creation. It's not who we are. We are of the creator. We are a chelik elekami mal mamash. What does the mamash part mean? Even in a physical body, we remain godliness. So when you go to the oil, you finally have an opportunity to encounter your true self. Your own greatness. I think you'll like what you find. <laughs> I hope. I'm sure. Why wouldn't you like it? Who doesn't love a neshama? Hmm? You can say something? If we're not feeling it, what practical difference does it make? Did you understand what I said? You under, I mean, intellectually, you understood it? Then you're okay. Then you're good. You don't need to be inspired. This is not a Broadway show. We're not here to entertain you. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. There are paths in Avedis Hashem where that is the goal, by the way. Where I want to feel it. Like you're saying, you're asking, well, what if I don't feel it? I want to feel it. There are paths in Avedis Hashem where that is the goal, to feel it, to feel something. What I'm telling you is this is deeper than feeling. This is deeper than feeling. You're not experiencing something. You are the experience. And maybe even you can argue that that got in the way. Don't, there's nothing wrong if the feelings come. Like, don't, 
run from them, but don't make that the goal either. In other words, Elocus shouldn't impress you. How? There's something wrong if Elocus is impressing Elocus. Like, the Rebbe wasn't impressed with himself. He said, ah, what difference does it make if I'm amazing? So, I don't want to say there's no place for it, and there are other paths in serving Hashem, but this path is about, don't be so impressed. This should be natural. This should be natural to you. Realizing that you are infinite and eternal and that your existence is unconditional shouldn't blow you away. It shouldn't impress you. It should feel really normal. It should feel normal. It should be like, hmm, okay. I heard that. That makes sense. Cool. Great. I guess that's who I am. No, you don't like that? Why don't you like it? To what? Doesn't sound like what? Doesn't sound like it impacted you? Well, what does it mean that it impacted you? Did it impress you? I told you the Alter Rebbe would hear the Maimarim from the, the Maggid, where they called them Taurus. And he didn't have uh, an out-of-body experience. He said, oh, cool. But it's the opposite. Can I tell you the reality? The, extre the extreme experiences tend to remain just that, extreme experiences. Wow, that was so amazing. And then the next day, it's lost. This is not amazing. This just is the truth about you. And then you get up in the morning, and it's still true. And then every moment, you have free choice to act like yourself or not. But at least the next time, God forbid, you do an Aveda, you should know you're betraying your true self. You're not acting like yourself. At least you should know what an Aveda is. What makes it dysfunctional is that you're not even acting like you. So that's why this is the mature approach. And hopefully, as you grow, it will have more significance to you. And if it doesn't mean anything to you for now, you can go back to we said we have the Baal Shem Tov and the Al Tareb. So you can go back to a Munap Shota and you can just say, I need to serve Hashem because he's Tati. And I am a Jew because I am a Jew. And I don't know what those things mean. I don't know what makes Tati Tati. I don't know what makes me a Jew. But that's what it is. And you can do that. But I'm saying we have an opportunity through having discussions like these that were not possible in previous generations. You could not have this discussion. We didn't have words for it. We can have a discussion like this where you can come away from it, and maybe you're not going to be blown away. And maybe you're not going to feel like uh, running out the, into the street and somersaulting. But you'll just have this calm, sober awakening that, oh, that's who I am. And you'll see it a little creep up on you and start to come out in your behavioral choices. What are you going to say? Isn't it selfish to want to connect to the tzaddik because then you're really connecting to yourself, so then it's selfish. No, I'm saying like, isn't it very helpful, like not helpful, like, like, oh, I want to connect to the rabbi, and then it's selfish. What's wrong with being selfish? What's wrong with being selfish? But if
When you're connecting to the tzaddik, you're connecting to yourself. That's right. What is the great What's great about being connected to yourself? Well, I could start by saying, how dysfunctional is it to not be connected to your true self? How many problems does it cause in life to not even know who you are? How much pain and confusion does it cause when a person doesn't even know who he or she is? I mean, would you agree that that's a problem? So it'd be good to know the truth about yourself. And what if you found out the truth about yourself is not that you're this worthless little ant or this crumb that barely deserves to be here. You don't even deserve to be here. Maybe that's not the truth. Maybe the truth is that you are absolute existence, that you, you require no validation for your existence. Your existence is as real as Hashem's existence. How does that awareness come from a connection to the Rebbe? The Rebbe is the Yechida HaKlolis, the aggregate Yechida for all of us, who reveals in us our godly essence. When we connect to the Rebbe, like it says in Perek Base of Tanya, right, chapter two of Tanya, that all souls come from the same level. And then the next page, he says, no, but there, there's different levels. Oh, hold on a second. And then he explains. Yeah, because some take the local train, some take the express. You know, some souls, when they're coming down to the world, they, 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 they stop off, and there's wear and tear at, di at, at different stops. And other souls, they come straight down to embodiment just from the highest heaven. And in embodiment, they have the same God consciousness as a soul in the highest heaven. So what does he say in chapter 2 of Tanya? The solution is, find such a Jew who in, in, in embodiment has the same God consciousness as a soul in the highest heaven. Meet that Jew, connect to that Jew, and by doing so, you will be returned to your origin, that you are also from that same place. So meeting the Rebbe, again, like Freddie Hager said, he nailed it. He said, I thought I was going to meet a great man. I left realizing I had met my true self. His kashas to a tzaddik is not to behold something other than yourself. It's to finally have a glimpse into who your true self is. I, I, I commonly experience that there's a lot of, like, hesitation to accept this idea. Like, we, we worry that there's something like, it doesn't sound right. Like, if it's not humiliating, then, it's, then it can't be authentic Yiddishkeit. <laughs> like, it's got to make me feel worthless, or probably not true. Like, why do we have that suspicion? Where does that even come from? If you actually learn this, your expectation should be the exact opposite. You, sh you should say, if it doesn't uplift me, if it doesn't empower me, then it's not authentic to this. What? What could still empower someone? Oh, you're a crumb and that's empowering? Okay, you're a crumb. In a different way. Like in an abusive type of way. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I need somebody to tell me how worthless I am, because we know, yeah. No, but I'm, I'm asking seriously, like, wh why do I need that abuse? And it's not even true, but here's the thing. It's not even true. First of all, it's mean. But second of all, this is probably more important, it's a lie, it's not even true. You're lying to me to put me down. Like, at least insult me about something that's real. To tell me that I'm worthless, it's not true. I'm an ashama. I'm infinitely worthy. When you say that word worthy, what part of it are you talking about? Like, we all draw our Islamic circles, and don't we also identify our personality as our life and just like other uh. patterns that we see them? And so, is this validation just simply just like that? Okay, okay. 
So now you're, oh, okay, that's a good question. You're saying, but there's layers to me. There's aspects. There's different, like, yeah, there's my essence. Very good, beautiful. But then there's other parts of me. Like I was saying before, Yom Kippur works. The atonement, the at one works because your Yechidah is always one with Hashem, even when you sin. Yeah, but what about that part of me that was sinning? <laughs> and what if I identify with that part of me that sinned more than I identify with my Yechidah? That's essentially your question. Right. And my answer to you, the short answer, is that's precisely why we're talking right now. That's why we're having this conversation. That's why I'm using so many words. Because I want your brain to start thinking in terms where you identify more with the part of you that cannot be tainted by sin than you identify with that part of you that does get confused sometimes. Of course, these are all parts of you. But I want you to start identifying with the core of who you are. And then maybe, over time, what we start to do is have integrity. You know what integrity means? Integrity doesn't just mean honesty. It means integration. Integrity means to be integrated. Fully, wholly integrated. The, the Lashon HaKadosh word for it is tamimus. Tamimus means... Follow what I'm saying for a second. That I have all these layers and levels when I bring them into alignment so I'm thinking and feeling and behaving in ways that are aligned with who I really am. That's called integration. But the only way to do that is you have to start with a baseline. You have to start with the premise, who's the real me? Who's the real me? Because if you believe that when you mess up and do something stupid, that's the real you, and then you try to get yourself integrated with that, you'll never achieve integration because your essence isn't that. So when you start believing the, 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 the hype about yourself that your own animal soul tells you to undermine yourself, what happens is you, you, you end up in, in, a, in a process of building a case for a false self that eventually is going to cause a major disruption because it'll never be aligned with your essence. So better go the other way. Start with the baseline. This is my essence. This is who I am. I'm godly. I'm here for a mission. I'm here to make the world perfect. If there are other aspects of myself that are not yet aligned with that, fine. OK, it's a process. I'm a work in process. Let me start bringing it into alignment. What, what, what were you going to say? Give it time. Give it time. The emotional experience, by definition, if it's a really legitimate one, if it's a really legitimate one, it can't be induced at the push of a button. This is a process. This is not a concert. This is not a concert where somebody comes out, they sing a song, and everybody cries. It's an idea. It's a deep idea. It's such a deep idea. People didn't know these things in previous generations. Let it settle in. Let it settle in and then see how eventually it starts to affect your other levels, your emotions and your behaviors and your thinking. Don't, don't get blown away. Don't try to get blown away. Just be comfortable with the truth and say, oh, OK. All right, I got it. And then see what happens. Pneumius, <laughs> by definition, takes time. It takes time. It's a process. It's a process. But you can't even engage in that process if you don't have a baseline for the truth. So first, know who you are, accept that, be OK with that and then slowly start to integrate that into the other layers, including your emotion. And then, at some point, you may come to feel very intensely about this. But if you're not feeling intensely about it right now, that's fine. 
In fact, not only it's fine, it's, it's probably better. It's more real. It's more excellent. You heard what she said? The goal of life? The goal of life, that's the goal of life. I mean, of the avaida, of the inner work that we do through our lifetime, is to get your animal soul to finally see what the godly soul knew all along. Yeah, that's it. And when we have conversations like this, this is a really, I hope, an, an important step in, in that happening. This is only the second Febrengen of the whole year. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so to be continued. To be continued? Okay, all right.